Welcome back for the last talk of the day. And I'm particularly grateful to Nulafar, who agreed to talk to us today on, effectively, yesterday lunchtime. So I think that's quite impressive, actually. Um, now, she chose... Um, she's from Iran and studied experimental sciences at high school and biology and then studied zoology at the Shahid Behesti University um, and so learned more about zoology, ecology, evolution and <coughs> ethology. And during that time took on conservation projects at the Gulistan National Park, which is the oldest national park of Iran. And she's travelled in the mountains, forests and deserts of Iran, looking for animals such as the Asiatic cheetah and Persian leopard, and talking, of course, to the local people to understand their conflicts, which can be very real, with different species. Now, she's just finishing an MSc course in conservation science at Imperial College, and we're very grateful, extremely grateful, uh, to her for speaking to us today about Iran, Crossroads of Wildlife. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's so nice to be among lots of young people. When I look at your fresh faces, it's just lots of energy for me. Thanks so much for coming. In the next 40 minutes, uh, we have a journey uh, into different places in Iran, and I promise that we will all enjoy it because it's a really magnificent, amazing country in terms of biodiversity and different landscapes. So, um, when I was told uh, to talk about Iran's nature, I was wondering how can I put all of these diversity and different landscapes and topographic regions together because it's a really vast country. Uh, so as you see here, there are uh, many different pictures, pictures from different species in Iran. Uh, Iran is home to more than uh, 190 mammal species, more than 2,800 amphibian species, and more than 500 bird species. So that's quite a lot to talk about. So what I did, I just put uh, four different ecoregions in Iran as an excuse to just have a frame uh, for talking about different places in Iran. As you see in this slide, uh, we got four different main regions, uh, uh, ecoregions in Iran, and it, they stretch from Caspian region in north to Persian Gulf uh, in south. So we're going to talk about different characteristics of these regions and also uh, biodiversity in each of them. So first of all, Caspian region in north of Iran. Uh, the first thing that uh, most of Iranians uh, remember when we talk about north of Iran is um, Mount Damavan. It's the highest uh, mount in not only Iran, but in Middle East, and also the highest volcano in whole Asia. So that's quite a um, really magnificent landscape for all of us in Iran. And there are also some seasonal wetlands and uh, main wetlands around the Mount Damavan in north of Iran. When we go east uh, to other provinces in north of Iran, we got these uh, amazing landscapes with temperate mixed forests, like coniferous forests, as you see in this photo. They are usually a lush lowland forest and they're home to many different mammal species and also bird in Iran. And then there are, of course, wetlands in north of Iran. There are usually really, really main sites for migratory birds. And we got 24 Ramsar sites in Iran. And there are six out of those 24 just in north of Iran in Caspian, Hyrconian region. Um, just, uh, just a little bit of information about Ramsar sites. Uh, they are internationally important wetlands or sites for migratory birds and also endemic native vegetation. And they are located in many different countries around the world and Iran got 24 of these internationally important sites. So this is a photo from Anzali wetland in north, um, quite west of Iran. Uh, that's a really, really beautiful wetland uh, with uh, lots of endemic native vegetation and flowers. 
So in this photo, I just uh, wanted to put some of the main migratory and also main birds in north of Iran. As you see, there's a um, fish eagle on top left, and also there are a crane in north of Iran that they migrate all the way from Russia. Uh, they stay in Iran for a couple of months, and they go down to India or also um, Saudi Arabia. And of course, in north of Iran, when we talk about Alborz ranges, there are wild sheep in north of Iran. And this is also a different species with other wild sheep in other places in Iran. And when, uh, in all the places, when you get prey like this, you also got a main predator for that. So this is a photo from uh, a Persian leopard in Golestan National Park of Iran. Persian leopard is the largest leopard subspecies in the world. We got seven different subspecies of leopard, and this one is actually the biggest one. So we want to go to West, Zagros region. This is the region of my ancestors. I'm coming from that region, so I feel a, a little bit different to this region. So the landscape looks like this in West of Iran in Zagros region. The rugged mountains and temperate forests like this. And as you see, the mountains look uh, really, really harsh in Zagros region. And of course, the species uh, should be really specialist to this region. Yes, Anthony, that's right. Uh, Anthony got those two wild goats on top of the mountains. And it's just incredible that you see them in a really harsh uh, situation like that. And Zagros Mountain is home to more than 100 endemic uh, plant species in Iran. And when we say endemic, it means they exist only in that region and not in any places in the world. In this photo, you see Fertilaria persica. This is one of the most important endemic uh, flowers to west of Iran. It's absolutely beautiful. When you go to west of, west of Iran in spring, you see the landscapes full of these red, beautiful flowers in Iran. And of course, in the background, harsh mountains of Zagros. So the winter is quite really hard, and the, the main trees or vegetation of this region are wild oak trees, which are also different from the oaks that we got in north of Iran. So as you saw in uh, that previous slides, this is a closer shot from a wild goats. Uh, I, I like to call them the king of the mountains because it's really, really hard to live in that situation in West, uh, but they're quite adapted to that um, uh, harsh landscape and habitat in Iran. This is a male wild goat and a, and a female one together, which actually makes it this photo really, really nice. And yeah, there we go. Those are, uh, this is a mom with two babies <laughs> on top of the mountains in west of Iran. It's absolutely amazing that uh, this photo shows how they walk in the streets of mountains in west of Iran. So let's go to central Iran. Yeah, as I said, I'm coming from west of Iran, Zagros region. But that doesn't mean, I mean I'm not amazed with this region. Actually, I should, I should say that, to be honest. Uh, the beauties of central Iran always makes me amazed and wondered. This uh, infinite horizons and a really, really meaningful silence in deserts of Iran make this place so beautiful and fascinating for not only local people, but for us as travelers or ecologists and biologists who travel to this region. So the landscape looks like this quite a lot in central Iran. So you see low vegetation and uh, also scattered rocky hills in that area. But also, there are sometimes landscapes like this, uh, and you see scattered uh, rocky mountains, but again, really, really low vegetation, because this area is really dry, and in some parts, semi-dry habitat or ecosystem. So uh, it's really harsh in terms of rainfall, and you can find and many green vegetation like west of, or north of Iran in this region. Uh, central region is home to many different mammals and birds uh, and also reptiles. Uh, th this photo shows one of the beautiful species of this place, uh, Gazella in Iran. And of course, uh, beside Gazella, we got Chinkara, but this Chinkara is different from the one that uh, you find it in India. 
these two are really specialist species to central uh, region of Iran because they can run really fast in that um, in those steppe area that you saw in the previous slides. And also one of the most magnificent uh, cat species in Iran, caracal. Uh, you see the color, is, it's just really, really camouflaged to that area. Uh, they, they, yeah, yeah, it's just um, about caracal, there are many amazing things, like they can run really fast, they can also live in rocky mountains in central region. So they are uh, really specialist cats for central region of Iran. And of course, not just caracal, but uh, central uh, region got uh, wild sheep and also Asiatic wild ass, that there are just two small population of them in Iran, one in central region and the other one in south of Iran. And you can find another population of uh, Asiatic wild ass in Mongolia, but they are really, really endangered species in the world, and they actually need urgent conservation act actions to survive in the wild. And of course, Asiatic cheetah. The last remaining population of Asiatic uh, cheetah are existing in Iran now in central region. I should say probably they are less than 40 individuals in wild. Uh, so they consider as critically endangered species in Iran, and there are many different international um, conservation actions uh, to maintain them in the wild, which is really important. This photo is really amazing. We got it recently in Turan Biosphere Reserve in Semnan province of Iran. Uh, we named this photo Hope because it's really hard to get, uh, I mean, now in the situation of uh, cheetahs in Iran, it's really hard for them to find each other in really long distances uh, in mating seasons. And um, this photo, because of two cubs next to a mother, uh, made us so excited and optimistic to just work more and more uh, on maintaining these uh, magnificent species in central Iran. I would like to show you a video that we got exactly in that same area during mating season. I hope it works here. I just would like to ask you to listen uh, to, this, uh, to the sounds carefully because it's really amazing. Oh, there's no sound? I just would like to ask you if, is it possible to, okay, perfect. Yeah, because uh, the main thing in, uh, about the sound is that this video has taken during mating season of Asian cheetah in Iran. And during this season, meme, uh, male individuals are just roaming in their territory and call in a really loud uh, voice uh, to find female individuals for mating. So uh, the, I think one of the interesting things about this video is just that loud call from this uh, male individual that we call it Kavus. We named, we named him Kavus. And you saw in the video that he came to that tree, that's a gas tree, it's a specialist um, tree in um, central region. And then uh, he smelled that tree because probably before, before him there was another Asiatic cheetah there. And then he smelled that tree. He sprayed his urine to that tree to just show that's his territory. And then it helps female individuals to find uh, males better. And of course, uh, Persian ground jay, it's an, another endemic bird to central region. You, you find this species only in uh, this region of Iran and not uh, anywhere in the world. This is quite famous uh, bird, and I, sh I can say it's a kind of a symbol for local people in that area because they do lots of handicrafts in different villages around central region of Iran with the photo of um, Persian ground jay, uh, and it's, it's really interesting for tourists in that area. And another endemic endangered bird in central region is Hubara, uh, which actually uh, this bird is endangered uh, because of the pressure of um, hunting and selling this bird to other uh, countries in Middle East because it's a quite um, f um, important and really favorite bird for people in that region. So let's go to south, Persian Gulf and Oman Sea region. 
I think one of the most interesting things about uh, south of Iran and Persian Gulf region is that there is a combination of rocky mountains and sandy beach in that area, which makes it uh, so different to other um, sea uh, regions in the world. So you see in this photo that uh, there are mountains like that and also a um, sandy beach next to the Persian Gulf. When we talk about Oman Sea or Persian Gulf, everyone thinks it should be just a sea uh, with beaches next to that. But when you go to the west and a bit up to north of that region, you got these amazing landscapes with palm trees in them um, and really, really harsh rocky mountains, which are home to Persian leopard, also hyena, and other large carnivores in Iran. Uh, Persian Gulf and Oman, uh, Oman Sea region, uh, because of uh, the adjustment to sea, got lots of different wetlands around that uh, you can find many different migratory species, uh, migratory bird species in that area. So this is Pelican uh, on, a, on Hormoz Island, very close to Bandar Abbas in south of Iran. And there is also flamingos who are migrating again from north to south and stay there and leave the country uh, during autumn. Uh, one amazing thing about this photo that I really like that is you can see the city in landscape because uh, this photo has taken on an island uh, very close to Bandar Abbas city. So you have Persian Gulf and in the landscape the high buildings in white, which actually makes it really interesting that very close to a large city like Bandar Abbas, you got wetlands um, like this with amazing birds who are living there. And of course, uh, it's um, Persian Gulf and Oman Sea region actually home to two uh, important species of the country, Gondo crocodile and Asiatic black bear. Uh, about Gondo crocodile, I should say that there, there is just um, a population of thousands of them in whole day range in the world from Sri Lanka in west to Iran in east. And also, Asiatic black bear uh, is a critically endangered species in Iran that we probably have a really small population of 100 individuals in south of Iran. They both need um, really, really urgent conservation actions to survive. And I think these two amazing species ma make south of Iran really uh, interesting for tourists. Uh, but it's actually really hard uh, to find, I mean, to find Asiatic black bear in the wild. But because people know this um, ecosystem is habitat to these uh, species, it makes it so interesting for them. And uh, the smallest wild sheep species in the world, that there's a population of them in Persian Gulf region of Iran. This is Laristan wild sheep. And it's quite famous among uh, trophy hunters because, as I said, that's the smallest species of wild sheep and it makes it... Um, for the uh, trophy hunters really interesting. This photo uh, has taken in West, uh, in Hormozgan province of Iran. Uh, this is a, re a really uh, amazing big male individual that you can see the horns are really big because you can guess the, the age of each individual based on the length of the uh, horn. So uh, from this photo, you can quite guess that it's, it's, a, uh, it's an old uh, big male individual. Okay, we talked a bit about different ecoregions in Iran and also this amazing biodiversity. But there are also threats. Uh, wherever you got wildlife and biodiversity next to people, there are threats uh, on uh, this biodiversity as well. So I would like to uh, mention four main uh, groups of threats on biodiversity in Iran. I would like to start with soil degradation uh, because of overgrazing and also full wood harvesting in different places in Iran. I took this photo in um, Zagros region. You see a farmer, a shepherd in that photo with a herd uh, in a really, really high land of Zagros mountain. Also, I should say, outside uh, the reason of grazing in that region. So these kind of activities put lots of pressure on biodiversity, more specifically vegetation of that region. And in this photo, you see, um, again, uh, I should take it, uh, I should take, took that photo 
I'm sorry, I took that photo from uh, west of Iran again. You see the oak forest uh, in Zagros region. And because of over-harvesting of uh, trees in that region, uh, it's, I should say, another main threat to biodiversity uh, in that area. And there's also loss of potential productivity of different lands in Iran due to overcutting and plowing of slopes. Uh, this photo has taken in north of Iran in Hirkanian forest. I was there with that local guy during a project in north of Iran. I got shocked when we, um, when we arrived at that area. He was talking to us that all those landscapes used to be part of Hirkanian forest, million years forest in north of Iran. But because of urban and rural development and also um, expanding of, extending of agricultural farms, you see that the landscapes is destroying every day, slowly, slowly. And uh, I think, especially in uh, north, uh, northeast of Iran, we need to, uh, we need to, I mean, put lots of urgent conservation actions if we want to maintain Hirkanian forest in that area. Illegal hunting and poaching is another uh, threat of on biodiversity in Iran, like uh, many different places in the world. So you see a road here in this photo, and also there are uh, poaching on car carnivores in some places in Iran, uh, because between carnivores and all, um, also, I mean, most of the time villagers in different areas, there are conflicts because they keep livestock in that area, they graze the livestock, uh, in middle of forests, so there's always a conflict between them, and as a consequence, these things happen to carnivores in different regions. And the last one, uh, it's over-construction of roads and mines and other um, human activities in different regions. This photo is from Golestan National Park. You see that uh, a road is crossing um, the forest in that area. This is one of the main biggest roads which connect Tehran, the capital of Iran, to Mashhad, which is another large city of Iran. This is one of the biggest threats to Golestan National Park and its biodiversity in north of Iran. Um, that, um, unfortunately, um, there's nothing, um, rather, there's nothing that local community can do about this threat. It, it should be something from government and law enforcement if you want to stop um, these uh, kind of um, threats on biodiversity in that region. And this photo is again from west of Iran. Uh, these constructions in west are building to farm fish. Uh, next to the rivers. This is Karun River, one of the main rivers in west of Iran, uh, which is coming all the way from um, top of uh, west of uh, Iran to Persian Gulf. So it's one of the main resources for not only the fish, uh, but also uh, villagers and local communities in that area. But because of these constructions that actually many villagers and local people are dependent on these kind of livelihoods in that area, there are pressure of uh, chemicals and these um, constructions on biodiversity in that area. And of course, when we talk about Iran, the, we have drought in Iran. Uh, lack of rainfall in different places, and of course we should know Iran is a a dry, semi-dry country in many places, we have problems like this. Uh, this is Uremia Lake in northwest of Iran, one of the most famous lakes in Iran uh, that we actually, I should say, lost more than 95% of uh, this lake during just like um, maybe 10 or 15 years, which is, which is just a tragedy, I think. Uh, due to extending uh, agricultural farm next to many lakes in Iran uh, to just extend rice farm or other uh, fruit um, farmlands, we lost many lakes like this in Iran. Um, this photo, I think this photo is a really serious alarm for all of us to just be aware about the consequences of these kind of uh, activities in Iran. Now you see that uh, this is a salty lake, and because we lost many, many, um, we lost the main area of that, now there are threats on villages and cities around this lake because of the salt winds during hot seasons, 
And then now, this is why many people in that area are just uh, shouting on government uh, during these seasons and asking them to do something uh, to bring this lake back. But after all, talking about all uh, these threats, should we say this is the end? This is the end of the world or Iran or every place that we got biodiversity and threats at the same time? I would like to say no. This is uh, when conservation is uh, just coming around, and it's about uh, using the natural resources in a wise way. We, we, can, we can define conservation as like this, because when we say we, 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 we want to use natural resources wisely, it means we should have a really long-term sustainable plan for exploiting resources uh, in different ways. So it makes it really important and at the same time really difficult to implement on the ground because it makes it a really interdisciplinary uh, issue because at the same time you just you are not just dependent on biology or ecology you need economists politicians sociologists and also psychologists in, um, in some cases to combine all this knowledge together and bring up a solution a sustainable long-term solution to exploit natural resources in a sustainable way so what, are, what do we do uh, as conservationists in Iran, or what conservation is about in Iran? I would like to talk about uh, the idea of nature school in Iran. So uh, the whole idea behind nature school is bringing kids back to the nature. Um, I'm sure you, you feel that we are getting disconnected from nature. Um, every day because uh, we are surrounded with the cities uh, there's no time for us to go to nature and experience how how it would be to sleep one night uh, in mountains or, or be in a forest that we can feel there's a carnivore like leopard in that or lynx uh, or other herbivores we are really disconnected with nature nowadays and it's getting worse and worse one of the main solutions to solve this problem is um, working with kids, bring them back to the nature. And nature school is a place for kids to come there, be in nature, even touch the, uh, touch the animals, and feel how it works to be part of the nature, how it looks like. Because sometimes they also forget what is a butterfly. They have no idea uh, how it looks like or what should it be in the nature. Uh, the idea of nature schools in Iran has started since four years ago, but thanks to this great man, Abdul Hussein Wahabzadeh, who founded this idea in Iran, after four years, now we have more than 50 nature schools in 20 provinces in Iran, which is absolutely amazing. And of course, more than 100 facilitators to work with, uh, with kids in the nature schools. I'm really optimistic and, uh, optimistic and hopeful about the future of nature schools in Iran because, to be honest, I see the future of, uh, no, I, I, I don't want to say conservation, but maintaining all the beauties of nature in the hands of um, next generation. And there are also some campaigns in urgent uh, situations like um, maintaining Asia Cheetah in Iran. So as I told you, there's a, a population, less than 40 individuals are them in the void. We don't have enough time to negotiate with government or convince different groups or parties in the country to just sit together and make a decision to um, conserve them. So that's the time of action, and we need people to help us. This campaign has started three months ago, and um, one famous actress in Iran uh, that you see in the photo uh, tried to um, um, actually launch this campaign and uh, ask people to help financially uh, to, get, uh, to get more than 80,000 pounds to relocate some of the main um, ranges from Turan National Park, one of the main habitats of Asian cheetah, to outside that. Because it's a national park and threats from livestock grazing and um, actually shepherds and also shepherd dogs in that region are the main threats on Asian cheetah. Uh, I should say this campaign uh, is quite successful now and we got more than 90% uh, of that 
uh, support we needed and we expected. So hopefully within three or four months, uh, we will be able to uh, buy those uh, rangelands from the livestock keepers in uh, to run biosphere reserve and just relocate them and have more space for Asiatic cheetah in that region. Uh, so when we talk about conservation, there's of course activities on the ground. You see uh, some of my colleagues in uh, these photos, uh, in this slide, it's not just working with rangers and training them with different monitoring uh, methods. It's also about setting camera traps to monitor uh, your target species in different areas and also rapid survey or long-term surveys in uh, harsh areas like south of Iran. And when it comes to wildlife, it's also about water in dry areas at, as well. So we managed to make um, some water resources, uh, man-made water resources for wildlife in uh, dry areas, which is, uh, in Iran, it's a really, really important action to make sure that they, can, uh, they don't have to come close to the villages to get access to water and be under threats of poaching. And about women in conservation, I really wanted to talk about that. There are more women who are working on the ground in conservation in Iran. Uh, and uh, I should say among a uh, young generation, these interests about working as a conservationist or biologist are increasing these days uh, because of all the different courses at the universities and also uh, different issues and threats on um, environmental um, in Iran. Uh, so there are my colleagues who are uh, working with rangers, training them and be in different areas to uh, work on different species. But who do conservation in Iran? Uh, it's not just about Iran. When it's about conservation, uh, it actually we should consider government, people, local communities, and all the groups who can contribute to do conservation. In Iran, of course, we got government, uh, actually Department of Environment as a governmental body that the president and vice president are in charge of making decisions and law enforcement about this department in Iran. And Department of Environment is a bridge between people um, and government in Iran. Um, and of course, we got local communities that we should definitely work very close with them to make sure that um, really sustainable livelihoods uh, are happening among them to make sure that uh, there are less threats on biodiversity in different areas. And of course, rangers and NGOs, uh, which are working closely together on solving uh, some environmental issues or problems in Iran. I wanted to uh, introduce you, uh, my team in Iran. There are young, dedicated, passionate conservationists who are working in different regions now. And I should say, I actually work with all of them now in Iran. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just really hard to be a conservationist in Iran and, and work uh, in an NGO, but they are all have a high value to save and maintain nature, which actually um, make all of us really optimistic, uh, optimistic and hopeful to work as conservationists. But uh, when it comes to us, to people, uh, how, we can, how we can help nature to survive or how we can uh, help biodiversity or wildlife to live uh, next to us, I think uh, it's not just about conservationists or government. Uh, it comes to our everyday life decisions. I think, I believe, the whole world is a connected system, and all, um, I mean, all of us at, as individuals can make a huge difference by our uh, everyday life decisions. Uh, for example, uh, when we live in London, uh, trying to be aware of the impact of uh, plastic bottles or single-use plastic bottles is, is one thing that all of us can consider. It's not just about uh, conservationists. Uh, or when it comes to food, being aware of how this food produced in different areas in the world, how it imports to our country, and how we can buy it or use it is one of the other things that we all can consider and, we, and be aware of that. Uh, so it's about all of us. We all individually uh, can have a huge impact if we just be aware of environmental issues, 
talk about it, uh, try to just be a little bit knowledgeable about different biodiversity in our country, not even in whole world, but just be aware of these things uh, can help us to be uh, to have more impact uh, on the future of biodiversity and nature in the world. I would like to thank uh, two of the main photographers of the photos uh, that you can also follow their pages to see other amazing photos of Iran's nature and biodiversity if you like. And of course you can visit the website of uh, one of the important uh, NGOs, environmental NGOs in Iran. You are all young, you have plenty of time to do lots of volunteering and you can visit Persian Wildlife website to see if there's an opportunity for you to be a volunteer in Iran and, and do something in Iran, for Iran's nature. Thanks so much for your attention, it was so nice.